Uh, thank you uh, uh, again, uh, for, for arranging this event. I'm presenting something from my uh, thesis, which is on designing large-scale bundling strategies in online retail. And I'll start with a simple question. Consider a retailer, Amazon, Walmart, Instacart. Suppose that the retailer has an inventory size of about 100,000 products. It wants to do promotional bundling, that is selling two or more products at a discount. Which two products should it choose? That's a fairly simple question, but the answer, unfortunately, is not simple. It's a combinatorially complex problem. Right? There are 100,000 choose two options to pick from, and that makes it about billions of billions of choices. Even if I make this problem slightly easier, I pick one of the products, let's say Doritos chips. Which product would make the best bundle along with this? Slightly easier question, but unfortunately, the answer is still not easy. There's still 99,999 products to choose from. Okay. Uh, what's ironic here is that bundling is actually not a new problem. It's very well studied, both in economics and marketing, and has about six decades of research. Yet, I would argue that there's limited principal guidance for retailers on how to actually create good bundles. Now, uh, for its credit, literature does give us valuable starting points. For example, if someone is buying a TV, you say, let me bundle a set-top box or a DVD player when they existed with this, and uh, that would be joint utility, higher joint utility of consumption because they're potential complements, so maybe that's a good idea. Fair enough. Or maybe if you take another product such as Chobani strawberry, uh, I can bundle Chobani vanilla with it. Those are imperfect substitutes. Give, them, give the, re, uh, the consumer enough of a discount. They'll buy both. That's more sales for me as a retailer. Again, a valuable starting point. Uh, but both of these sort of limited guidances assume that the retailers know which two products are complements or substitutes to begin with. That in itself is a really hard problem to do, especially at scale. Most of the products are not co-purchased together or are hardly ever co-purchased. And the typical way of doing this through structural modeling considerably narrows the scope on identifying which two products could be complements or substitutes. So the question then we ask and answer in this paper is how can we design principle and scalable methods that managers can actually use to come up with good bundles? And the way we do it is through, through this sort of involved framework, and I'll take us through this step by step, and then uh, through the rest of the presentation, I'll give you a highlight of each of those steps. So we work with an online retailer, and we use their granular clickstream data, which means we observe everything that users do on the retailer's website. We segment that into two parts, products that people buy and products that people see but don't buy. The first part is called purchase baskets. The second is called consideration sets, everything that the consumers chose to look at in the anticipation that they would buy but did not. Once we have these two sort of granular data sets, we estimate product embeddings on them, which if you're from an economic bent of mind, the best way to think about them is approximating a giant cross-price elasticity matrix with heuristics for complementarity and substitutability. We're trading off structure for scale to be able to come up with approximate values of how any two products can be complements or substitutes. Once we have those heuristics, they form the key ingredient in this bundle design recipe, and we come up with a candidate field experiment where we create 18,000 bundles for about 4,500 products, and we randomly show them to users. We observe what people like or they don't like by observing what they buy or they don't buy, and this gives us sort of clean, unbiased training data to come up with an optimized bundling policy, which means for any given product, we can select which is the best bundle, as given by this uh, exposure, uh, randomly exposed training data. And then at this point, because we've run the experiment, we have historical pretreatment variables, we can optimize this policy and generalize it to the entire assortment. We show that this optimized policy increases revenue from bundles by about 5%, with roughly, roughly, uh, by about 35%, which roughly, roughly translates to about $5 per each of 100 bundle views. And this is generalizable to the entire assortment as well as robust across all product categories. And once we've established this framework, we actually design a much larger field experiment that not only covers a larger consumer base, but pretty much the entire assortment of the retailer. Because of time constraints, I'll speak from uh, for points zero to three here and give you a flavor of what the second field experiment looks like, but happy to answer questions across uh, any of these points. Admittedly, this framework is a bit involved, so I think it's important to highlight what's new here. The first is embeddings, this whole idea of coming up with 
scalable measures of complementarity and substitutability have been on the rise, but we are the first ones to be able to incorporate historical granular consumer search data to estimate scalable heuristics for product or of substitutes. Second, uh, the bundle action space is about billions of options. Ideally, we'd like to experiment on all of them. Right? But time is finite and I needed to graduate, so we experimented on a small subset of them, but we show how you can use embeddings to come up with a smarter field experiment design that allows you to explore this bundle action space more efficiently. And finally, we developed this end-to-end -end machine learning framework that allows us to solve a core marketing problem at scale. Once the paper is published, we'll make the code online so that other uh, researchers and retailers can use it. More practically, again, this translates to about 35% increase in revenue, which is about $5 per 100 bundle views. And importantly, we also have managerial insights for retailers which may not be that technically sophisticated to run this kind of a framework, but would still like to use off-the-shelf bundling strategies. Okay. So, key thing that uh, requires some attention here is the data. We observe everything that consumers buy. So this is one example of one consumer shopping session. What we are trying to learn is come up with methods that can allow me to make the following statements. Coffee and, chi coffee and milk are complements. Milk and cookies are complements. Chips and salsa are complements. Again, this is very easy to do when somebody pictorially places them and I can hand annotate them. It's really difficult to do this at scale especially when there are hundreds or millions of products in the assortment. Analogously, we also have products that people see but don't buy, and we want to come up with statements such as, these three types of coffee substitute each other, or these three types of chips substitute each other. And that's a simpler example. We can also come up with statements like, this coffee substitutes tea more than it does Red Bull. Again, it allows us to make these statements at scale and across the entire product assortment. So with this granular clickstream data, we estimate product embeddings. I'll give a feel of what they are, but again, happy to answer questions. The way it works is follows. Suppose there are only three products in the entire assortment. I randomly initialize all of these products in a two-dimensional space. That's, I'm just giving each product an x, y coordinate without seeing any training data. Then I look at the training data, which means I look at two products being purchased together. If they're purchased together, I move those points slightly closer in the space. And I repeat this process as I take in more and more product baskets, thereby changing this map to something that looks like this. Each point is a product. Proximity between any two points is a heuristic for how strongly they complement each other. The x-axis and y-axis, the, the, the numbers don't mean anything, only local proximity matters. Why do they reflect complementarity? Because they're more frequently co-purchased with each other, but we kind of smooth over raw co-purchase frequencies, allowing for higher order interactions. Analogously, we also have all the products that were seen, but not purchased together. And that gives us a metric for substitutability. Again, each, product is a, uh, each point is a product, but now we have a metric for substitutability, which is how closely these products are on this latent space. Easiest to see in this example, organic russet potatoes, potential complements include other types of organic veggies. Organic russet potatoes, potential substitu substitutes include other varieties of potato or potato-based dishes. So these heuristics, they form the key ingredient on how we design our experiment. And the way we do it is as follows. For any given product, any given candidate product, we come up with four different bundles in an attempt to learn this complicated bundle action space more efficiently. Again, we'd like to experiment with all of them, but there's only finite resources that we can do it. So we come up with four different bundling strategies. The first is just using raw co-purchase. That's what has done well in the past. We hope that it will do better, but now because we're randomly exposing people to these bundles, we can map them to these underlying heuristics that will allow us to scale to the entire assortment come up with two different complements, one within the same category and one across a different category as well as a different department. These are based on the complementarity embeddings and one based on imperfect substitutes, which is bundling something like Chobani, and, Chobani strawberry and Chobani vanilla. We show these bundles to users and then observe whether they buy or they don't buy. The idea being we want to learn and optimize bundling policy for them. And this is the result for that. The, Bar on the left is our optimized policy. This is run through standard offline policy evaluation. 
and in a, evaluated on out of sample data using a self normalized inverse propensity score estimator so it's sort of clean unbiased evaluation and the rightmost is a pretty strong baseline which shows how well the bundles would have done if we had only relied on historical co-purchases. The difference between the two is about 35% in revenue gain and about $5 per 100 bundle views. The two bars in the middle are using only either complementary bundles or only substitute bundles, but the bar on the left calculates the optimal mix of them. And the whole reason the scalable is in the title of the paper is because this method really gets benefit when you're able to scale to the entire assortment. So these are uh, bundles generated using the entire assortment of the, late, uh, of the retailer. As we go towards the right, they're less popular products, but we'll see that the gain from the optimal policy actually increases as we go into the right tail of the product. Again, the gains will really come when we are able to scale it to the entire assortment. And something about managerial insights, if you're a retailer who'd be able to use this framework, by all means, but if something that you're constrained with, we suggest either starting on the top left or the bottom right corner of this pyramid. These are good bundles or good candidate categories for cross-category bundles that we found in our data. And finally, we ran a much larger field experiment with this, the idea there being showing people, I would say, uh, more complementary or more substitute bundles in the attempt to learning an even better policy, the whole idea being learning through adaptive experimentation. Ideally, we'd like to do this in kind of a bandit style, but most technical infrastructure does not support it, so we kind of made our own version of it, which we call lazy bandits. I'll stop here, uh, but happy to answer any questions. <laughs>